那么接下来我们就要进行专题演讲。欢迎专题讲座的主持人，国立政治大学教育学院余明林院长，掌声欢迎。呃、uh, ，President Lee， 呃、uh, ，President Vice President Jen， and our guest speaker， and、uh, ladies and gentlemen， and it's my honor to introduce today's speaker.、Uh, Dr. Michael Corbett,、uh, he is a professor of educational、uh, school of education, edu education、uh, from Acadia University, Canada,、uh, and he is an expert in educational sociology. And we、uh, invite him to give us an important speech today. And I think、uh, this is the topic thing. On the screen, ah,、uh, revitalizing rural school. Ah,、uh, I think、uh, Dr. Corbett、uh, is an expert uh, from uh, the Canada, and I cannot wait to listen his speech today. And ladies and gentlemen, let's applaud, welcome、uh, Dr. Corbett.、Uh, Thank you. Maybe this one. Okay. Well, thank you very much.、Uh, it's wonderful to be here, and I want to thank the conference organizers. I, I'm going to take this thing off. I'm hearing myself speaking English. <laughs> there. Oh, this is better. Yeah. Wow. Had a bit of an echo there.、Um, yeah, I do want to thank. Uh, the conference organizers, Dr. Chen, Dr. Li, Dr. Su, who've、uh, taken Hernan and I through rural Taiwan. We got to visit some schools yesterday,、uh, which was very interesting.、Um, I want to begin by talking a little bit about where I come from.、Um, you may recognize, you probably don't recognize this. I should have a full map of Canada, but this is the eastern part of Canada on the Atlantic Ocean, and it's known as Nova Scotia.、Uh, it was settled, colonized by the English and the French, who fought over the territory for many years in the mostly in the 16 and 1700s. Uh, the indigenous people who were living there before that. I have a tiny little bit of indigenous blood, seven or eight generations back there. I was not raised in an indigenous family, but I am, like many Canadians,、uh, a product of the relationship of a colonial intervention, a long-standing colonial intervention in North America from Europe. Nova Scotia means in Latin New Scotland. Many of the people who have settled that area are Scottish, but the people who were there before that are the Mi'kmaq. So I want to acknowledge that I come from a place called Mi'kma'ki,、um, which is the indigenous territory, the unceded territory, as we say. This was never given to the British,、uh, and hopefully, in my talk. This will connect to the whole idea of rural and what counts as rural. I also want to acknowledge I have a connection to Chengchi University. I would not be in this place if it were not for a man named Dr. Mervin Chen, who studied at this university from 1957 to 1967. He was here. He is a sociologist. He's still alive. He's 92 years old. And when I mentioned to Dr. Chen that I'm coming to Taiwan to speak, he said, "Oh, where are you going?" I said, "National Chengchi University." He said, "That's my alma mater. This is where I went to university." So, thank you, Chengchi University, for producing Dr. Mervin Chen, who produced me as an academic. I was a working class boy.、Uh, Almost ready to quit in my first year, and Dr. Chen was handing back papers one day in my introductory sociology class, and he looked at me and said, "About four words, you have an eye for this," and he 
kept me in the game. And it's a game I'm still in. So uh, this is Dr. Chen. He sent me a picture of his library card from 1963, I think. You can read this. I can't. Um, so rural education. What's it about? Um, when I addressed this conference in 2021, I spoke of problems faced by rural schools and some concrete solutions that have been proposed and enacted in North America and in Australia. Most solutions are highly contextual, context specific, and they reflect possibilities of within a decentralized education system. Canada has no national ministry of education. We have local uh, provincial uh, administrations. Um, they also relate to the always emerging dynamic socio-political developments nationally and regionally. Frankly, it would be presumptuous of me to imagine that I have answers to educational problems in Taiwan, although later I'll, I'll venture a couple of examples. With respect to rural education, um, what, what I have are more unanswered questions relating to uh, rural education in your country. And I began to get some answers uh, yesterday, traveling to rural schools and getting to see experimental uh, education in this country. Um, so I come here less with, more with a curiosity than with a set of uh, solutions to, to your issues. I, I'm interested in the conversation and how we uh, might learn from one another. I suspect the problems you might nominate for rural schools, and this was mentioned a little bit in the introduction, are what uh, Rattel and Weber called uh, wicked problems. And I'd recommend a classic 1973 paper. They differentiated between tame problems, which are largely mathematical or engineering challenges, and wicked problems, which are political and contested problems. Uh, they use the example of road building to make this distinction. While it might not be an easy problem to solve, how to build a road is a mostly tame problem that can be answered conclusively, definitively. Where to build a road, however, is a wicked problem, which involves complex choices, negotiations, evaluations of human interests and power. It's my view that education poses mostly wicked problems that we've tried to tame by subjecting them to measurement and quantification. I was asked to speak today to solid actions for revitalizing rural schools. Um, this seems to me to be a classic wicked problem for which there are no definitive answers, no clear definition of terms, no right or wrong solutions. I'm depressing you here, there are no, no answers. Um, but rather solutions predicated on different political worldviews and visions of the relationship between the country and the city. Perhaps the most frustrating element of wicked problems is that every problem is a symptom of another problem and all solutions generate new problems. The internal combustion engine solved a lot of problems, but it created a host of side effects. The same can be said for microcomputers, mobile phones, social networks, uh, and generative AI now. These technologies create what Anthony Giddens called ontological insecurity or what Ulrich Beck characterized as ubiquitous risk management in late modern societies where our solutions have become our problems. And of course, we need to act. That's another dimension of wicked problems. We can't ignore them, even if we can't solve them, even if they're very difficult to deal with. They're pressing, they demand our attention, they require our best effort and immediate action. How educational problems are constituted, though, is central to the formulation of solutions and solid actions. Little seems solid these days. There are many ways uh, in which the term can be interpreted, but I will assume you are looking for something like definition number four in the Oxford English Dictionary, which means dependable and reliable. Dependable and reliable for what purpose, though? Or we might ask, for whose purposes? The idea of solid action begs a question about the desired ends or outcomes that these actions might achieve. Schools are institutions that operate within dynamic and even liquid social and political contexts, economic contexts. In Taiwan, there may be a consensus about educational outcomes, but in my Canadian context, there is not. For example, there's a very lively debate 
going on in Canada today concerning the interpretations of natural, national history and the impact of colonization on Canadian society, and how schools teach children about democracy, justice, truth, and equality. Uh, with your even more recent history of multiple colonizations, I expect Taiwan is no stranger to these problems of constructing a national story. The traditional 20th century story of the founding of Canada goes something like this. The ancestors of indigenous people populated the Americas by crossing a land bridge from Asia at the end of the last ice age. These ancestors were Stone Age hunters and gatherers who lived on the land until the arrival of the French, English, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese in the late 16th century. The European colonizers claimed to have brought advanced civilization, metal-based technologies, European trade goods, true religion, uh, all to replace allegedly pagan mythologies. Thus, the lives of the indigenous people were vastly improved. The Americas were claimed and fought over by European powers, and to make a long story short, the British permanently defended the claim to what is now Canada. Canada is to this day a constitutional monarchy, and the official head of state of our country is the English sovereign. But Canada is also a settler society like South Africa, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Israel, and Taiwan as well, I think. Permanent European settlement created what is understood to be rurality. Rural didn't exist until the Europeans arrived. Over time, the indigenous people became increasingly marginal due to forceful dispossession, European diseases, and the inevitable advancement of agriculture, industrialization, and majority settler populations who exploited what was considered to be unused and empty land, terra nullis in uh, Latin. The indigenous people who did not integrate into mainstream settler society were given what are called reserve lands from the latter part of the 19th century, and they were supported by what was considered to be a benevolent government through the Ministry of Indian Affairs. Today, the indigenous peoples are losing their language and suffer from a multitude of social problems. Some variant of this story was taught to Canadian school children until very recently. It has long been understood by Indigenous people that this story is a complete fiction. But it is one that has shaped how most of the population understand the country. One particular omission is the fact that Indigenous children uh, were... I'm ahead of myself here. Indigenous children were, were forced from their homes into large centralized schools, which were typically far from their families and operated by Christian religious denominations. Residential schools operated for more than 100 years until the mid-1990s. My first teaching job was uh, in a community in the mid-1980s, uh, was on one of these in indigenous reserves, and I heard stories from elders in the community about their school experience. They were worked, brutalized, assaulted, told their spirituality was demonic, and their language was primitive. Ironically, these schools were long considered solid actions to civilize and assimilate indigenous people into modern society. Between 2007 and 2015, a national commission crossed the country interviewing thousands of people, reviewing millions of pages of documentation to find out what happened in those residential schools and how this history has affected subsequent generations. The report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was released in 2015 with 94 specific calls to action to reconcile the harm that was done and to teach Canadians the truth about how the country was created, including how treaties were ignored and how the Indigenous people never surrendered uh, the territory. Remember my introduction, unceded territory. When the federal government accepted these recommendations, the Canadian state effectively acknowledged that it was constituted on stolen land. And 60% of Indigenous people today live in rural uh, territory that's designated rural. We can talk about what rural even means, and I think it might be an interesting thing to talk about. Um, so, what are the solid actions that might follow from 
the calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report that redress this obvious wrong. Indigenous people rightly argue that the country must get beyond fine words and move to solid actions regarding land ownership, financial restitution, mineral rights, pipelines, education, Indigenous self-governance, political representation, to name a few. In relation to education, the actions the TRC recommends, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, TRC I will call it, um, are, is a rewriting of much of the school curriculum uh, in language, social studies, and the humanities, and the arts. And indeed, it can be argued that this is what is happening. Um, I note, again, that more than 60% of Canadian Indigenous people live in places designated as rural, so this is very much a rural issue. Things get even more complicated because, for some time, other marginalized minorities, such as African Canadians, LGBTQIA plus people, uh, people with disabilities, and indeed rural citizens, have demanded recognition and a commitment from education and employment systems to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Equity, diversity, and inclusion has become so common, we now just use three letters, EDI, to describe it. In pretty much all Canadian public education systems, EDI is being integrated into curriculum, pedagogy, and learning materials, initial teacher education, teacher professional learning, and assessment. I expect you might, as, as I expect you might imagine, many Canadians do not agree. And some of them see this, these developments as an imposition of state power and an American-influenced woke left-wing ideology on the children. Others argue that neither they nor their children have any responsibility for the atrocities of the past, and so why should they be taught to feel guilty about their history? Some religious Canadians uh, see EDI initiatives as secular propaganda that unsettles fundamental truths that they hold very dear and wish to pass on to their children unchallenged in the public schools. Still others argue that any nation needs a coherent and positive national story, or what Plato called a noble lie, that promotes patriotism and solidarity amongst all. So there's a great deal of contestation, discussion, debate, uh, disagreement in terms of what this system should be doing. In recent years, a parents' right movement uh, have emerged to challenge these EDI developments, forcing the removal of books from school libraries and classrooms, challenging the curriculum and teachers' practices. Some groups also demand control over young people's decision to choose their gender. I don't know if that's an issue that you're facing. Uh, and even to restrict the use of certain words in school. Here we encounter a middle-class resistance to power of the state and the control of experts. Um, who have exercised power over the framing of educational problems. Some of this resistance resonates with non-Indigenous and non-racialized rural people who have themselves felt disempowered, ignored, and marginalized. I hope this story illustrates that the solid actions chosen will depend on the aims and objectives of those who choose. Educational bureaucracies do not operate in a political vacuum. In addition to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and discussions about EDI, how to teach children to read and do elementary school mathematics uh, uh, are described metaphorically as wars in North America these days over about what solid actions are necessary to do something as simple as teach somebody uh, the discipline of mathematics or introduce them in, to that in school. These wars reflect the academic and civil society debates about how and what to teach. And I guess it's nothing new. The history of educational reform in North America is something of a graveyard of solid actions to replace other solid actions in what Larry Cuban and David Tyack have called Tinkering Toward Utopia, another book I would recommend. The rural-urban binary continues to be something of an educational war zone as well. I think it's safe to say that North American uh, academic field of rural education has long been dedicated to defending uh, existing rural schools and local educational governance against modernist tendencies toward centralization and standardization. 
In Canada and the U.S., there's no national education system no na or no national education uh, curriculum. Despite this radical decentralization of educational governance, rural schools have been relentlessly closed, consolidated, and amalgamated, and many rural citizens still mourn the loss of governance and authority and their small community schools. They often blame the all-too-solid policy actions of the state for destroying rural places. So I'd like now to turn to the idea of revitalization. Um, the root word here derives from the Latin vitalis, or life force. Vitality is lively and energetic life. So rural revitalization is a common term used in community development discourse in North America, and it suggests here that life was once vital in rural places and by extension in the schools. And now we want to bring that vitality back and recover what was lost. Indeed, this is precisely the message of populist politicians, which is the idea that an imagined vital past that was unjustly disrupted can be recovered for rural communities. This is Donald Trump's message. Make America great again. Uh, make the rural communities great. With respect to the idea of rural school vitality, I see three propositions. The first proposition, rural schools were once vital. Proposition two, rural schools ceased to be vital. Proposition three, rural schools should and can once again be vital. In my Canadian context, there is ample evidence of a loss of vitality in rural regions, and obviously this has consequences for rural schools. The story of the massive population shift from rural to urban is the story of the 20th century in much of the world like the story of the peopling of Canada that I just told. It's mythologically presented as an inevitable result of industrialization and modernization. Simultaneously, attachment to rural land is constructed as problematic. American farmer philosopher Wendell Berry, the old guy by the woodshed there, uh, argues that anyone with a strong attachment to rural or indigenous land is labeled as primitive and doomed to be pushed out by the invisible hand of technology and capital not by deliberate action or state policy. A recent US television program, I don't know if you have it over here, Yellowstone, plays powerfully on this theme uh, and the resulting rural resentment that's all too common in North America. In my own work, I've struggled to understand the impact of this displacement on rural schooling and communities. I found that rural education has been historically structured to do the ideological and political work of facilitating the movement of people from the countryside into urban spaces. I called this process learning to leave. Raymond Williams, a British uh, historian, social theorist, calls such phenomena structures of feeling that subtly reflect and shape the normative cultural scripts that we all live within. To put it in stark terms, those students considered successful in rural schools have been those most likely to leave their communities and never return. In my own work, I've struggled to understand the impact of this displacement. Um, ironically, I argue rural education has played a part in systematically undermining the vitality of communities by supporting the removal of human capital from rural places. Rural schools serve precarious economies and rural primary industries are notoriously unstable and dependent on commodity markets. It hardly needs to be said that as work in agriculture, forestry, mining, and fishing have mechanized, fewer work workers are required. The structure of feeling uh, produced is a very uh, solid social story that takes on the appearance of a kind of natural inevitability and is a proxy for progress. So what might revitalization look like? This is a truly wicked problem. One that populist politicians use in their rhetoric about making the past glory return to rural places. Consequently, much rural revitalization discussion in my country is backward looking and nostalgic. The past vitality of rural communities is linked to non-indigenous national ima imaginaries and foundational myths about the settlement and development of democratic governance, the production of national identity out of regional and local geographies, and the rise of the state and its institutions. Um, 
The story here is that the country began with the fur trade and logging and moved on to agriculture, ranching, and mining that brought the settlers who formed rural communities. The rural mythology aligns with the 20th century myth of the founding of the nation that I recounted earlier. Schools play a vital for part in this mythology. There's a lot of folklore about rural schools and the heroism of rural teachers. Popular rural fiction perpetuates uh, these illusions in series like Anne of Green Gables, which is something of a cult following in Japan. Uh, however, historical scholarship shows that rural schools were poorly attended, taught by young women filling in a year or two between their own schooling and marriage. And these transient teachers boarded with local families and had to bargain for their own wages with local trustees. Rural schools were operated more or less autonomously by the communities until the 1960s and were typically ill-equipped uh, facilities lacking basic amenities. If it can be said that Canadian rural schools were ever vital, this might be from the 1950s to the late 1960s, when rural populations were still significantly, uh, were still significant and country roads were paved, facilitating the busing of students to larger, freshly built, consolidated, and regional schools. Newly unionized rural teachers were also better trained and better paid, although not as well as their urban counterparts. Ironically, this modernization process started a long history of rural school closures that continues to this day. Rural schools are often considered to be the heart of community in places challenged by depopulation and by policies supporting the movement of people from the country to the cities. Here we see the convergence of competing ambivalent visions of vitality, modernity, technological pro progress, rural stagnation, depopulation, and it's a wicked problem mess. Um, this is the ambivalent history of rural schooling I encountered in oral history interviews that I did when I was researching learning to leave. When I spoke to you last in 2021, I highlighted a few of the many nested wicked problems. I think I'm behind here. <laughs> I'm not sure where I am in this slideshow. What number is that, 29? Doop, doop, there, I guess that's where I am. Um, faced by rural communities and by extension of their schools. Problems like rural rurality and poverty are correlated. And yet the correlation is not simple. It masks the economic diversity within rural places. Rural poverty is often solved by individuals through migration to the cities. Distinctive forms of social and cultural capital, including language, are often constructed in rural schools as deficits. Rural schools face chronic distance and density challenges, and this is made worse by funding models designed for cities. Rural regions and schools perform below urban and suburban locales on standardized assessments in most countries. And finally, teacher shortages are chronic in rural schools and how to recruit and retain teachers is a wicked problem in itself. Beginning in the 20th century, many solid actions for rural school revitalization have served to professionalize, specialize and bureaucratize rural schools and draw them into the mainstream of North American life and learning with little regard to rural economies, social organization, and cultures. In my country, until quite recently, this has been the extent of rural education policy. A couple of provincial reports are out there about rural education, but they sit on the shelves and nothing is ever done with them. I admire what you're doing here, actually paying serious attention to rural schools. Beginning in the 20th century, whoops, excuse me. I considered this narrative about urbanization, capitalist growth, and the role of education uh, in the process as teleological. Teleologies are narratives that focus on an end, retrospectively explaining how events and processes contribute to the inevitable achievement of this end. Uh, an example is Marx's idea of uh, uh, current class struggles will ultimately lead to communism, or Francis Fukuyama's idea that the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, with that collapse, history was over and all nations of the world would become liberal democracies. With respect to rurality, I see three related teleologies operating. First of all, the urbanist teleology, the narrative of the inevitability of rural decline. Secondly, the capitalist growth teleology, 
Continuous and sustained economic growth creates a better world, and anything or anyone that stands in the way of this growth is a problem. And finally, the human capital, scholastic teleology. Increasing levels of formal education generate economic prosperity for both individuals and for societies. These teleologies drive what I've called the mobility imperative in rural education, which situates formal education as a mechanism to encourage population movement out of rural areas and indeed to define educational success in terms of moving on uh, to urban or higher education. Anyone who's been to a North American rural high school graduation cannot fail but to notice how these ceremonies celebrate those destined to leave, particularly for an urban university. In rural areas, social mobility assumes geographic mobility for youth, and inculcating this imperative has been a core academic mission in rural high schools. It is, though, an ambivalent one, and many teachers and principals feel that it's a shame that the best and brightest, quote unquote, have to leave, but that's just the way it is. Teleologies work to restrict discussion of the political nature of problem formation. Establishing a particular narrative about the direction of history, in this narrative, rural areas are relegated to historical artifacts or alternatively as mechanized resource extraction zones or areas of agricultural production that require only a small human presence, often one which is temporarily employed. In this construction, education is an escape narrative, and those who do not complete higher education and fly away to the cities are positioned as losers doomed to remain in the rural areas doing menial work. And today, education met metrics reinforce the urban rural division. Um, related comparative metrics and so-called efficiency initiatives are also used to justify the closing of rural schools. Some of these are population projections for school-aged children, uh, student-teacher ratios, unused school space. Um, um, the economists take a look at us and decide we're not really, we don't deserve to continue to exist. But something has happened in rural Canada, particularly the area I live in. There are always surprises. Um, at least two of my three metrocentric teleologies now seem unstable. In recent years, things have changed in rural communities in Atlantic Canada on a number of fronts. First of all, state policy is focused on immigration and refugee resettlement in rural areas. And you see that graph, and it, it, it shows how from 2000 to about 2014-15, population was basically stagnant, and it has grown uh, quite strikingly since then, mostly because of a state policy to encourage immigration to Canada. Um, this movement has generated unexpected population increases with a housing crisis in rural areas that have been losing population for generations. Uh, COVID has precipitated youth retiree professional movement back to smaller centers and select high amenity rural places, principally because of lower housing costs compared to places like Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto. Um, and because people can now work online. We learned that during the pandemic. Place became much less significant to uh, occupational uh, functionality. Shortages of trades and professional workers to service this population growth have uh, occurred as well, and labor shortages in primary industries have also emerged. Uh, we're importing agricultural workers from the Caribbean and people to work in fish plants from uh, Eastern Europe. Some rural schools that were in danger of closing due to low enrollments are now overcrowded, in part due to previous generations of school closures. And finally, the climate emergency has shone a new light on the capitalist growth teleology, reflecting a new concern for land, water, and stressed rural environments, which have been largely ignored and taken for granted in uh, Canada's rural hinterlands. Because economic and cultural resources opportunities related to formal education and political power are concentrated in metropolitan areas, it's possible to argue that rural people are an equity-deserving group, like indigenous people, racialized minorities, sexual gender minorities, and people with disabilities. 
In the last decade, Canadian educational systems have begun to support historically underserviced groups through solid action. I mentioned EDI, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, has become established in Canadian education um, and non-Indigenous rural activists have jumped on the bandwagon claiming equity status for their left behind or forgotten communities. There's also considerable evidence that rural North America heavily <clears throat> supports populist politicians who reject pandemic, thank you, restrictions, climate action initiatives, as well as EDI policies like affirmative action and um, targeted university admissions for equity seeking groups. Indeed, many rural citizens support political and educational mandates that seek a return to a lost vital past in which gender was binary, uh, integration, immigration was virtually non-existent, and everybody went to Christian churches, uh, and the mid-century rural industrial infrastructure flourished. And as I write, yet another xenophobic populist ideologue is elected, this time in, in the Netherlands, garnering much of his support from rural areas. In order to address the question of solid actions that might support revitalization of rural schools, I need to make some assumptions, which could be wrong in relation to Taiwan. I'll assume that established practices of translocal governance, professionalization of teachers, moving teacher education into universities, closing rural schools, standardization of curriculum and assessment practices, and other modernization efforts have not succeeded in supporting rural vitality, which may be why you asked me here. I wonder if rurality is now constructed as an equity category here in Taiwan. I think I'm gonna skip a bit to a couple of stories. I'm running a bit behind here. Um, yeah. I wanna talk briefly about a couple of projects um, that I think integrate academic education with rural place sensitive education and the first one uh, that i would like to talk about is it uh, found in a 20, 2005 book by uh, jack shelton entitled consequential learning i've given a copy of, the, of this book to professor chen because i think he, uh, it's, it's very useful shelton makes three basic points first he says there's a gap between the places where education policy is made and where rural people live as such, curriculum and assessment are deliberately insensitive to the situation of rural learners. Secondly, rural schools are pressured to conform to norms and regulations made in faraway places by distant owners of these schools. Thus, schooling is made to feel like an imposition on community designed to discipline and reform rural people rather than to nurture and enhance the vitality that exists within them. Thirdly, the work of children in these schools is neither connected to the real and consequential things that people do in the communities, nor is it visible to the people in these communities. Student work is sealed off in a black box called school that has little connection to community life. Sheldon argues that rural schools are designed as places where students enact mysterious performances invisible to the community. And these performances are game-like and are evaluated by external authorities and carry no immediate visible consequences. By, conse by contrast, engaging rural students in caring for animals, plants, and elders, young people engage, excuse me, um, they learn that if the plants are not watered and the animals are not fed, they die. This is a reality that most rural youth understand, and it's a reality that has been removed from schools. And Shelton argues that um, we need to reintroduce consequences into the educational process. So not only is learning place-based, it also matters for its own sake. And authentic care is built into the curriculum. Shelton follows John Dewey's pragmatist maxim that schools are not a game, they are life itself. A story is told about John Dewey's two-year trip to China in 1919 uh, and 2020, in 1921. Dewey was given the name Do Think because his ideas about the primacy of experience in education followed by reflection overturned established ideas uh, um, about thinking before you do something. I've got one minute left. The last uh, thing I want to talk about is a little book that I wrote 
uh, with a group of colleagues in uh, 2016. And this was a project where we went into rural schools. We were invited by a rural school principal who said, I need my teachers to become more up to date. And we want you to bring some technology into schools and try to enhance the teaching of literacy. So we uh, got a grant and from the national government and we brought video cameras into these schools in 2008 and 2009. And we worked with a filmmaker to develop a process of documentary filmmaking. And uh, we write up that work in this book. Uh, the whole idea is that literacy today is much more than uh, pencils and papers. It's also about visual literacies. It's also about making meaning in new and different ways. And that rural youth need to be connected to these new developments just as much as urban youth do. And it provides an opportunity for these young people to be able to uh, share life in their communities with uh, people anywhere in the world. And what else do I have here? Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's all stuff. Blah, 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 blah. I think that's probably good enough. I do have a bit more, but I have shared a text and uh, it can be translated, I hope. And I'm, I'm happy to share it with conference presentations in that way. Conference presentations, conference attendees. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I have a question for you. You just um, yeah, yeah, yeah. mentioned about a newly vital and even uh, clouded rural schools. How was that happened? You know, um, it's very difficult for us here to vitalize, revitalize the rural schools. Uh, how it happened there? Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, I think one of the arguments I'm trying to make is that revitalization uh, of rural schools is intimately connected to the revitalization of rural economies. And the pandemic created a, a very unexpected wave of movement from people from large cities into smaller cities and also spilling into rural areas. So, in a way, this had less to do with what um, rural schools themselves were doing than the economic and social circumstances surrounding it. Um, the whole idea of place-based education, uh, where rural communities and communities generally, place-based education is an idea that doesn't just connect, as you know, I'm sure, it doesn't just connect to rural places. It's the idea really coming from the pragmatist tradition, John Dewey, uh, and the idea that any education needs to begin with the experience of individuals in the places where they live. And I think the best rural schools um, in our decentralized system historically always operated this way. They always brought elders into the, into the school to speak with the children. They did things like school gardens. They uh, connected to local culture, local storytelling traditions. Um, and I think those schools in rural communities did a very good job of connecting the children to the places where they grew up. Now, I'm somewhat critical of this because I think 
that whole process also makes it potentially more difficult for those children to understand that their communities are in a wider world and that the connections between this place and other places are really central to what I think a good rural education should be. So uh, Hernan and I were speaking this morning at, uh, at breakfast and, and, you know, I think the best we can do is to use rural places as a perspective looking out at the world. You see the world from wherever you are. And uh, if we develop schools and curriculum that, that operate in that way, that the curriculum resources come from the local area, but they also connect to the broader geographies, uh, that will become, I think, a much more powerful thing. And how to do that? That is a wicked problem. That's a very complicated uh, thing. We have rural teacher shortages. It's a difficult job to attract teachers into rural communities. So there's a whole discussion about what can be done to bring teachers in. And I know you have a Teach for America variant here in Taiwan where um, that may have some level of success. In Canada, it, it's almost non-existent and it hasn't been particularly successful. In the United States, it's mixed. Some times some in some places it works other places it doesn't um yeah i can go on and on and on about this but uh, uh i don't does that even come close to answering your question yeah thank you i'm not sure this is working but i'll try it <laughs>我發現這個大都市有很多問題也有很多的問題是一个比较适当的一个赛事So he's my good friend, so I know what he's asking. Um, he said that um, there are problems for the rural areas and also problems for the urban areas too. So his question was, what's the idea size of the place that you're thinking about? Oh, about what kind of size uh, is a, a rural uh, place is? Oh, that is the, the, the million dollar question. Yeah. He's do, the vice president. How do we define rural? Um, I think it's a very complicated problem. I mean, there are many different ways that, that rural rurality is defined by different national <clears throat> governments. Canada, I think, has about four different ways that, that space is divided and scale. Um, the one that I prefer is actually it has less to do with um, the density of population and more to do with the movement of people it's called the metropolitan influence zone and what the metropolitan influence zone is it, it separates and divides the uh, society in terms of the percentage of people 
in the place who are commuting into metropolitan areas. Um, most definitions of rurality are problematic because they sometimes count places that are very close to cities, where they're essentially com commuter communities, where people uh, are living urban lives, have all of the advantages of urban areas, uh, but they live in a place that is small um, and apart from the city. So this idea of, of commutability, so if you live in a community where 10% of the population commute into an urban area, you're fairly isolated. If you live in a place where nobody, there are no people who are able to access urban areas, um, then you are very isolated uh, in terms of the metropolitan influence zone. So I think that's an important dimension of this. Um, in some ways, the way that these definitions work uh, in, in North America is the space outside of metropolitan zones is designated rural. So a rural area in Canada can be an, an iceberg in the north. It can be a large farm in Western Canada. It can be a fishing village like the ones that I studied in, in uh, Atlantic Canada. They can be mining communities in the north. So there's a great diversity of places that fall underneath this umbrella. And I think the work that people like Heronan and I do, we're trying to complicate this rather than simplify it. Because we think the, the, the simplification, the binary classification of this place is rural and this place is urban is problematic. Now, having said that, I'm going to tear apart my argument. <laughs> And to say that rural is also, it's not just a demographic, physical geography uh, thing. It's also a cultural um, sensibility. Uh, it's uh, a, a feeling, it's a way of behaving, it's a way of uh, um, consuming cultural products, it's a way of speaking, particular dialects which are uh, distinct to particular communities. Um, I live in a, a, I still live in a very rural area. I live in a village of um, maybe 150 people uh, live in this, this place. And I can go down the road 50 kilometers, and I have a hard time understanding the English that's spoken in those villages. And uh, so, you know, there's a very interesting kind of dimension to rurality in this way, that it's linguistic, it's cultural, uh, and in a way, it has to do with how people self-define, self-identify. -identify. It's an identity construction, as well as a demographic. There's a last little bit, there's a great paper by uh, Joe Reed, Bill Green, and uh, friends called, uh, about rural social space, where they create this triangle. Morality is demography, how people are, economy, what it is that people do, the traditions and the histories of, and industrial work, and it's culture. Um, and I think that's a much more richer, but a more problematic and difficult to study uh, characterization of, of rurality.请各位还有什么问题要提问喂你好我是那个东华大学博士班的学生那我叫阿里这样子那我想请教就是那个教授就是说因为我们来自一个两百多人的地方然后我们是那个花莲县港口部落所以我想说刚刚请教就是说关于那个教授可不可以给我们一些指点
这个两百多人的地方，应该也可以经营的很好。这样，谢谢教授。Thank you very much.、Um, a couple of things. First of all, if you can make your school so powerful and so important to the community. And you have the the support of of community members. You're much more likely to be able to keep it going. So this is、uh, it's a bit of a, a you know you have to become politicians I think in 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 uh, in uh, in my experience.、Uh, government responds when a community can come together coherently, cohesively, and apply pressure to talk about the importance of the school to the community and. Why closing that school is going to create more difficulties than it solves?、Um, there's an important idea I think that we've been working on. I, I do activist work with small communities. We go in and we try to、uh, fight government, basically, <laughs> with、uh, small rural communities. And we uh, uh, we've come up with this idea of the hub school model. So, okay, you're in a community where you have a small school, maybe. Fifty students, let's say. Nine students. Okay, it's a, that's problematic. How do you keep that open? How do you justify that? Well, maybe you can't. But if you bring in healthcare service into this, let's have a nurse in that school, so people in the community can come in and they can get healthcare support,、um, family literacy. So if we want to not just educate children, we also want to support families. Uh, supporting their own children to become better readers.、Uh, let's have some family literacy. So we developed this idea of the transparent school wall. You know, I talked about the black box. Let's take the wall away, and make the school be able to see inside the community, and the com- and、uh, the community see inside the school, and the school see outside into the community. So I think the more activities. You can、uh, introduce into that school. The more difficult it becomes for that school to be closed, and the better your arguments are to keep that school open.、Um, I also think you know the place-based education movement.、Um, uh, the two schools I visited yesterday,、uh, the, this question was asked: How do we get parents involved? Well, you need to invite them first of all. <laughs> One of the things I, I was a school.、Uh, Small school teacher myself. We had a, a coffee pot in the school, and parents just came in, and at ten o'clock, you know, everybody would come and have a drink of coffee. And the teachers bought them coffee, so、uh, you know, this actually opens the door, makes the school a friendly place. You know, the history here is very interesting. I taught in a fishing community, and these fishermen, who were Strong, big men, very successful fishermen, fifty years old, would come in through the school door. I remember this very distinctly. And this big, confident guy walks through that door and he starts to shake. And he said to me, "I remember how horribly I felt in this place. Ah,、uh, thirty years later, it still comes back to me. It's still an emotional thing." So what we tried to do was to create in that school a place where the community members, the elders, the families could feel comfortable and would want to come.、Um, and I think there are many ways you can do that.、Um, lots of photographs, pictures of the community, pictures of the children all over the school. Paste the school with photographs of of life in the community. I think is a very important you know kind of visual representation. Uh, of how the school and the community are together. That, 由于时间的关系，我们这一场专题演讲就到此结束啊。那我们接下来有二十分钟的休息时间啊。那我们 take a break. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Dr. Shaobai. 我们中场休息，休息到十一点。十一点的时候，第二场专题。